Now, before I start doing this experiment due to a Danish physicist by the name of Ersted, let me preface it by saying that when I'm running an electric current through this wire, it's going to be a rather large electric current. And this is not something that you should be attempting to replicate yourself. If you don't know what you're doing, this is the sort of thing that can cause a fire. So don't do it. Anyway, when Ersted did his experiment, one way you can do it is you can lay a wire right over a compass needle, like so. And when I go ahead and cause a current to flow from the left of the screen to the right of the screen, we see that the compass needle swings out. We can do the exact same thing, but with the compass wire going under the compass needle, and we see the compass needle swings the other way. Also, if we were to reverse the direction of the current, we would get the reverse results. So what are we supposed to make of Ersted's experiment? Well, we see that if we have an electric current, which means that we have moving electric charges, it causes the compass needle to swing. Now we know that compass needles like to align with the local magnetic field, so it must be the case that if we have a wire, in order to replicate what we saw, the magnetic field would have to look, say, something like this. Um, if you play with this and do it for a while, you'll conclude that the magnetic field lines have to look like circles, concentric circles around the wire going all the way along the wire. And you'll notice I'm drawing in a little arrowhead. That's to give a sense of the direction of the magnetic field. Now I am absolutely awful at being able to try to draw this sort of thing in 3D. Now you'll notice that we've got the conventional current going to the right. So if you were to take the thumb of your right hand and point it in the direction of the conventional current, what you'll find is that the magnetic field lines will follow the curl of the fingers of your right hand. More of the point, they don't curl around in the opposite direction. So what we have is a whole bunch of circles um, following the curl of your right hand. Now, it's probably easier if we look end on at our wire. So let's say we have a current that is coming out of the page here. Remember, a point like this means that the tip of the arrow is flying at you. So if we have a current coming out of the page, the strength of the magnetic field will be stronger when you are closer to the wire, and it gets weaker as you get farther from the wire, as you can see by the increase in spacing on our magnetic field lines. So again, remember the way we interpret the lines is, say if this is the point where we want to find the magnetic field vector, it'll point tangent to the lines in the neighborhood, and the strength will be proportional to the density of the line. So if the lines are spaced closer together, this arrow would be longer. And again, this is following the curl of the fingers of your right hand. So if you point your thumb out of the screen, you'll see that your fingers of your right hand curl around counterclockwise. 
And if the current were going into the screen, we would again see the exact same concentric circles that are again spaced closer together the closer you are to the wire. Um, except that now they would be oriented clockwise. So go ahead and try that with your right hand right now. Point your thumb in towards the screen, your right thumb in towards the screen. You should see the fingers of your right hand curl clockwise. So this is the sense of the magnetic field that we make. Also, by the way, because physicists usually don't like to draw in 3D, they don't usually draw an edge-on view of the wire like this. Instead, they're more apt to draw a purely cross-sectional view. So again, if I have my current flowing to the right like this, um, what a physicist is more apt to do is just draw a whole bunch of dots here. And then matching them. Sorry, that top row of dots should be spaced further out. If I see we're running out of space there, so I'll bring the next row in maybe. There we go. And then draw a whole bunch of X's, um, or it often gets called cross. Um, basically for how the British refer to that shape. Um, they call the game tic-tac-toe knots and crosses because a knot is another way of saying zero, which is the O in tic-tac-toe. And then they call the crosses, uh, the X's in tic-tac-toe crosses. So um, sometimes you'll hear physicists refer to these X's as crosses. Anyway, um, when you look at this, the picture that you should still see is that these are concentric circles. They're coming out of the screen at the top and into the screen at the bottom. So for instance, these two here are part of the same line. It came out of the screen, curled down, following a circular path that looped in front and downward to go into the screen over here. And then behind the screen, it continues in and starts going upward and then comes back in to complete the circle. So it's the exact same thing as drawing this circle right here. That's the out of the screen bit there. And that's the into the screen bit right there. So this down here is usually how we would draw such a thing. Now, this is interesting. So although this is not the electric force, there is something different going on here. Um, Apparently, moving electric charges can make magnetic fields. And since we saw that the magnetic field can interact with a compass needle, by Newton's third law, there has to be some way for the compass needle to go back and interact with a moving electric charge. Um, that will be the subject for a future video, but that does indeed happen. Now, the other thing to notice here is that we've got a lot of stuff happening at right angles here. Um, the electric field, or sorry, the magnetic field line here is everywhere perpendicular to the current that's making it. So when you start seeing perpendicular things, the thought of cross products um, should start to come back to mind. And yes, indeed, they are going to rear their ugly head again. So 
let's draw a plane here. So if we have two vectors, let's say the vector C here, and oops, let's do a better job of drawing them. The vector C here and the vector D here. And let's say the angle between the two is equal to phi. Um, the cross, the magnitude of C cross D will be equal to C times D times the sine of the angle between them, phi, if you put the two vectors together tail to tail. But remember, a cross product gives us a vector as a result. And so our resultant vector here, C cross D, points perpendicular to both of them. Now importantly, remember that the cross product does not commute. So D cross C points the exact same way upside down. The way that you figure out which way the resultant vector points is given by the right hand rule, um, which I'm going to show you here. So let me preface this review of the right hand rule by saying that there are probably about as many ways of doing the right hand rule as there are people. So I'm going to show you the way that I do it. If you know of some other way that you like that gives the same answer, that's great. Go ahead and use that. So first thing to remember about uh, cross products is that the order of them matters. So C cross D will not give us the same thing as D cross C. It will be the same magnitude, but the direction will be opposite. So the way I get the directions is I make my right hand like this widget here. Now don't use your left hand. That will give you the exact wrong answer. You have to use your right hand to do this one. So the way I think of it is I go first things first, second things second, answer on the thumb. So you always put the first vector on the first finger, the second vector on the second finger, the answer goes out on your thumb. So let's take a look at C cross D here. So we can see that C is pointing to the right, D is pointing up. So I have first things first, point my index finger along C, and then second thing second, align my middle finger to point along D to see that C cross D goes out of the floor. Now what if I was doing D cross C? If I was doing D cross C, again, it would be first things first. So D is the first thing that goes on the first finger. C being the second thing in the cross product would be second thing second. So you still got to keep your finger index finger pointing along D, rotate your hand around your index finger until you line up with C, and my thumb is pointing into the floor. So C cross D goes into the floor. Now you might wonder, what if the angle between our vector C and D is something other than 90 degrees? Well, that's okay. Let's make it bigger. So you're allowed to move your middle finger around like this if you want to get a perfect fit. Just don't hyperextend it. This is bad. But it, keep it between your index finger and the palm of your hand. You're fine. So I can still do first things first. And then here to get the second thing second lined up, I would just have to move my middle finger a little more. And again, I get that C cross D is out of the floor. Or let's do it for an angle smaller than 90 degrees. Say something like that. So again, first things first, I put the first vector along my first finger. Second thing second, I line up D with my middle finger here. So you see I moved it in like this so I could match the angle. And again, the answer is still out of the, out of the floor. 